This podcast is brought to you by Aldis International, supplying your expert AI and digital transformation staffing needs across the U.S. and Europe. Today, you are listening to our AI in Action series, where leading minds in AI from across the world share their story, success, and advice. AI in Action cuts through the hype and explores the true impact of artificial intelligence in our world today. You're listening to AI in Action. I'm your host, JP Valentine. Our guest today is Kevin Brody. Kevin is the team lead data scientist at Orbital Sidekick. Kevin, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Kevin, let's start with yourself, please, as always. Um, Would you give us a bit of an overview and your background in technology from where you got started, some of the roles you've held along the way, take us up to today as the team lead for Orbital Sidekick? My background's, you know, kind of interesting. I have a couple bachelor's degrees. So I started off at University of Maryland, not really knowing what I wanted to do. I ended up getting a degree in kinesiology sciences. At the time, I was real into, you know, working out and everything. So it just made sense. It was pretty interesting. I got to actually spend some time as an intern in the strength and conditioning department, running the wrestling team and swimming and diving team through workouts. But towards the end of my uh, first undergraduate degree, I realized I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. A lot of my uh, peers were going into physical therapy, medical school. So I ended up interning at a physical therapy office and realized that was not for me. So I graduated, took a semester off. was like, you know what? I'm going back for engineering. So I went back for a second undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. I got through it, did well. But kind of like when I first started, I, I was not really feeling the classes too much. I was more into just the underlying mathematics and felt that we were glazing over some of those things. So when I was going through this degree, coming to that realization and the fact that it was my second degree, I I didn't get a lot of opportunities to uh, internship or or gain real world experience. So I ended up having to cold call and trying to get an unpaid internship at some local companies, which that actually worked out for me. So I got this small local company, just like a couple of people, and I was given the opportunity to start writing a little bit of code to try and determine when basically soldiers or athletes had developed traumatic brain injury from some impact. And what they were doing was they placed sensors on to people's scalps after they had gone through some injury, and they would measure the vibrations of the vasculature around the head. And so... That was basically, I was given the opportunity to get into signal processing, a little bit of machine learning very early on. At the time, I was so new, I didn't even know it was machine learning, to be honest. But it kind of really planted that seed in my head that, yeah, I want to go in this direction. Uh, So I was able to leverage that opportunity to get my first real job as a defense contractor at Northrop Grumman, where I also pursued my master's part-time in electrical engineering, where I really just focused on signal processing from a more modern perspective, along with data science, machine learning, and mathematics. And while I was working there, I was doing some ML. I was doing a lot of basic scripting. I was doing all kinds of stuff, messing with hardware, a lot of adaptive signal processing, those sorts of things, radar imaging, working into the SAR, which has kind of helped I leverage that to get into the position I am now. Um, Within the defense contract, it was a good opportunity, but I just felt like I wanted something a little faster paced. So I saw this opening at OSK and here I am. Thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate you sharing. I think it's important for people to hear, particularly who are starting out on their journey, because it's not a straight line, not to be too cliche. There, there's a lot of road bumps and pivots along the way, but it's worked out for you because you had an idea of what you wanted to work on and you stayed true to that, which leads nicely now into your new role, which is your the lead to ML data scientist at Orbital Sidekick. So firstly, tell us all about Orbital Sidekick, who you are, what you do, mission of the business. The mission of OSK is to build the most robust remote sensing and analytics capabilities with a core focus on sustainability. So what that means is basically are launching our own hyperspectral satellites that will collect information about a given region. On top of that, we build an analytics platform to provide near real-time analytics to customers. And the idea is to develop these analytics around promoting sustainability, ESG, environmental sustainability, governance is a big area right now. 
Uh, so like our primary customer kind of go to mac market is the oil and gas industry. So we do a lot of pipeline monitoring and we have other projects working on comp carbon monitoring for carbon offset projects, mining and those sorts of things. That's quite a complex industry to run real time monitoring and it's a lot of critical infrastructure. Can you describe the machine learning and data science at play, what you and your team does day to day and what a typical project looks like? Maybe I should just give a little context on the actual data that we're playing with. Yeah. I mean, most people are very familiar with just traditional kind of RGB camera, optical things, or just op maybe even multi-spectral satellite imagery. With hyperspectral, instead of having three or 10 channels, we have hundreds of channels that we're measuring of the electromagnetic spectrum. So RGB might get three channels from 400 nanometers wavelengths, like 850 nanometers. With hyperspectral, we're looking from 400 nanometers up to around 2,500 nanometers. Hopefully that makes sense to someone out there. And so the idea is that we can really exploit all this extra, these extra channels to, to learn more about the environment. So the big things, like I talked about, is the oil and gas monitoring is when you collect all this, these extra channels, you can start to detect targets or signatures of interest that aren't visible in the traditional RGB wavelengths. So the big one that you might've heard of is uh, methane plumes. There's tons of articles out right now about how devastating methane is to the environment. And such a, it's such a big contributor to uh, climate change. Being able to de detect those leaks early and have them and have the pipeline operators fix them. It makes you feel good. Yeah. So staying on that topic then. So I want to get a sense of what it's like day to day for you and the team. Firstly, how big is your team? How many people are involved? The combination of data science, machine learning, working in conjunction with the data engineers. Can you walk us through what it looks like there as part of the team? So we're a small team on, I know on my side, there's two, two people on my team. Then we have our director, and then there's two people on the remote sensing science side. So add them all up. That's about six, just in, in the kind of data science track. Within my team, a lot of it's model development, data wrangling. I think the trope is that 90% of your time is spent wrangling data. And I, that really is just the truth. When you're dealing with remote sensing data, probably the biggest or one of the most challenging aspects is ground truthing. You know, you're, you're sensing something from in this case, space, which is 500,000 kilometers away. And so you're trying to understand what you've actually measured on the ground. So unless you have somebody out there who can take a ground measurement and correlate it with the GPS, you're, you can end up having to guess. And this kind of leads me, I, I didn't, I remember thinking back, I didn't actually answer your like original question before this. So just jumping back into the types of tasks. So what ends up happening with hyperspectral is that each material on the ground has a unique signature. And so we really try and exploit that information to build our algorithms around, right? So you do have that benefit going for you where you have, you can build a spectral library, this type of material, say methane has this specific absorption features at these wavelengths. And I can exploit that to try and build a detector around it. You have some good prior information of what you're trying to detect. And so you can do a lot of, I guess, more traditional statistical methods, hypothesis testing and build detectors around that. And so a lot of the baseline algorithms are built around that. And then we try and refine them and improve them over time, machine learning techniques. So yeah, you can start to fuse other information about the local background, for instance, in the methane detection. We might know that the roofs of buildings or roads are common confusers because of the correlation that particular material has with the methane signature. If we have another signature for those confusers, we could start to train models using that side information as well. You are listening to the Aldis Podcast. When you're looking to scale your team, or if you are interested in showcasing your company in a future episode, reach out today. Or if you're in the market for a new role, visit our website to view open positions, www.aldis.com. What are some of the biggest challenges in getting these models into production and scaling them? Just given the, the complexity of, of the data sets and how, it, how it's changing all the time, what are some of the biggest challenges you and your team face? And then the obviously follow-up question to that is, what do you do to overcome them? A lot of times our model, we don't have to make these giant models. It's not like 
the real popular diffusion things that are coming out with the or Dolly 2 and those sorts of things, we can get away with, with smaller back no, backbones using like a ResNet 50 or something. So scalability hasn't been too big of a concern for us. If we had like a hard real-time requirement where we were trying to get an answer out and downlink it in a milliseconds or something, then I think it becomes more of an issue. But we do have a bit of buffer time, uh, even on board where we can run these things. I think that's probably in the, maybe the more interesting area around this particular question is the putting algorithms on board and actually getting those insights down. So when we generate these data, it's they're huge data sets, right? You could be collecting a thousand pixels in one direction, and then you use the motion of the satellite to collect in the other direction. So that's, it could be 10,000 samples in that direction. And then you have the spectral direct dimension, which is 400 channels. So you're looking at terabytes of data for just a one given asset that you're trying to monitor. So, you know, downlinking time becomes a huge issue. So that's why the idea of having analytics on board is a big thing for us because we can collapse everything down just to a single channel detection map, or even just a lat long with couple attributes of interest and downlink that information much quicker than we could the entire data queue. Staying on the topic then of, of your team and the work that you're doing, obviously there's a, an ever increase in investment into AI to combat climate change. And a lot of what you're talking about is linked to that. When you look at the roadmap for Orbital Sidekick over the next 12 to 24 months, what sort of growth do you expect to see? as a business from customer use adaptation, but also then impact on the team itself from a headcount perspective? Sure. So uh, we're looking to launch our two satellite. And so once we get that the kind of data deluge starts to begin, we're constantly monitoring places and downlinking the data and working with that. And once we start doing that, we also get another dimension for the data, which is time, right? So we can look at the same area, maybe every, once every month or something on that order. And we can start to fuse that information to, to derive new insights. So I think once we do that, I think we scale with the rate of the data as well, right? So then the head count starts to increase as we need more heads to start looking into the, all this data that we're collecting. So I'd ex I would expect that we will grow, but given that we're so hardware based, we're generating our own sensors and data. It's going to scale with that rate. So I don't, I can't really put a, a hard head count on it, but. Going back to the anticipated growth, you're obviously the team lead there for data science. So you're heading up a lot of the projects working with the group. As somebody who is on the inside and you have a sense of what the roadmap looks like, when you're speaking to people about the work at Orwell Sidekick, the environment, the culture, and the impact that you can have, what is it that you tell candidates it went, as and when you're interviewing them about the work and the mission that gets them excited enough to join you guys over some of the other great companies currently hiring? I think it, the data is unique. Before this, Hyperion, I think, is the first hyperspectral satellite, which was relatively recently. So there's not, there hasn't been a ton of work in the hyperspectral domain. So it's pretty novel, right? So getting to apply ML to that is just fun. I've always been more motivated by data that's derived from sensors or from some natural phenomenon as, a, as opposed to maybe something like building recommendation systems. For me, I really like having that kind of physical science tie-in. So I think other people who are into space and physical sciences really enjoy that aspect. And as I mentioned earlier, the ESG, the environmental stuff, every, you know, a lot of us, and especially in the younger generations, really see that as a huge area in trying to help out with the climate change. So I think that's a big selling point for everybody. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on today and talking to us. Fascinating work that you're doing with Orbital Sidekick. Sounds like a really cool use of AI, ML, data science. And yeah, we wish you, the team, and everyone at Orbital Sidekick the best of luck in the months and years to come. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Aldis Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any Android podcast of choice. You can also head over to our website, www.aldis.com, to listen to more podcasts, view our open roles, and stay up to date with industry news. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more great episodes coming very soon.